Hello, hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, welcome to Indian Lake Baptist Church. Uh, we want to say, you know, thank you to Living Waters Covenant Church to be here also. Uh, to the pastor, Christine and John Stewart, thank you for joining us. And uh, thank you for uh, being this day, you know, here with us. We want to start with uh, a prayer to start. So let's pray. Father, we are here united to give you thanks for your love, for uh, the sacrifice that Jesus did on the cross for us. We want to celebrate, but also think about you in this time. We want that you guide us. I want that you be with us today, at the same time that we are here together, that we could celebrate together um, what Jesus did. Guide us, bless us, and bless this time today. In the name of Jesus, amen. Sing together. There we go. We're going to sing together number hymn number 323, written by Isaac Watts in uh, the year 1707. So it's a uh, 315 years old. Uh, Isaac Watts was a very prolific uh, hymn writer. He was a uh, a pastor in England. Uh, he uh, he wrote "When I Survey the Wondrous Cross" and "At the Cross." probably best known for writing Joy to the World, uh, Isaac Watts. So, uh, I've been thinking of the words for At the Cross all, all afternoon, and uh, it, uh, it really personalizes uh, the experience uh, at the cross. Uh, uh, as you, uh, as you uh, think of the words as we sing them, uh, Realize that it, it was our sins, it was my sins that, uh, that Jesus hung on the cross for. And, uh, um, and uh, Isaac Watts was just filled with, uh, with uh, emotion at the, at the fact that his, you know, it, uh, Jesus was on the cross uh, for, for Isaac and he was on the cross for each of us. As we sing this song, uh, we'll sing... We'll sing the verses that show up on the screen. There are five. There are five verses. Uh, I, uh, I'm not sure if uh, we'll uh, we'll follow the screen. And oh, there are five verses. Okay, we'll sing all five verses. And you can uh, you can remain seated as we uh, as we sing this. But uh, will you think of the words and uh, think of uh, think of the tremendous love that was shown on the cross for us at the cross.
Okay, um, uh, for those one, I introduced myself like, uh, like I was kind of Sunday, but I forgot about uh, our friends from Living Waters Covenant Church. My name is Lucio Berumen. <laughs> I'm uh, the pastor of Indian Lake Baptist Church, so, so you know, thank you and welcome you know, to be here. Um, and also um, is with us uh, the current congregation, you know, the pastor El Pla. Is, is with us too, so maybe we could meet each other on um, the lunch that we have after. But yes, I just come and say, and, and I forgot to introduce myself. So continue, we wanna read the scripture. Um, it's gonna be Isaiah 53, two to five. You could uh, check it out. You could go through the, to the Bible that is in front of you. I will start, okay? Isaiah 53, through to 5. He grew up before him like a tender shot and like a root out of a dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract, to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering, a familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in a low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him Punished by God, stricken him, strict by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgression, he was cursed for our iniquities. If the punishment and brought us peace was on him, and by his wound we are healed. 
Today, we want to invite Pastor John Stewart from Living Waters Covenant Church to share with us. Well, good evening. And thank you, thank you to everybody here at Indian Lake, Pastor Lucio, John, for arranging this. Uh, it's good to be here. Uh, it is, as been mentioned, obviously we all know that we're here this evening for what is ironically in some ways termed Good Friday. And we know it's good because of what comes out of it. But I want to take us back to that Friday as best we can and see it as a day that is not so good. And I want to ask this question, have you ever felt forsaken? Have you ever felt absolutely alone? And I would say that probably for most of us here, I know many of you, and I will speak for myself, I have not ever in my life felt forsaken. I have never in my life felt absolutely utterly alone. And it's hard to express what Jesus was feeling on the cross, that forsakenness that he felt. I felt discouraged. I'm sure you have too. I felt a bit of despair at certain times in my life. I felt a little depressed now and again. I felt disappointed. But I've never, ever felt forsaken to the measure that Jesus felt on the cross on that Friday. Now, I want to shift gears for a moment here to get us into what I want to talk about tonight. And so I'm going to begin, and I'm going to ask you, it's going to be a little interactive here. I want you to complete the phrase. So if I say, a penny saved, you say, a penny earned. Or if I were to say a stitch in time, does anybody know what that means? Because I don't. But we all know it, right? We all can say it. For God so loved the world, right, he gave his only son. And you could probably go on. Our Father, right, we could go on. Now the reason I say this is because I want to ask the next question, which is this, this idea of being forsaken, is what was Jesus thinking on the cross? And the church for 2,000 years, and I mean by church, I mean with a capital C, Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant, coming down for 2,000 years, one of the things that tradition tells us that we have backed up by Scripture is one of the things that Jesus was say, thinking on the cross we have revealed to us by Psalm 22. And here's this man that Pastor Lucio read the scriptures was despised. He had nothing to attract others to him other than the fact that he was the son of God and people could see there was something in the way he taught and the way that he approached people, the way he made people on the margins feel welcome, that he challenged those who were in authority, wrongly in authority, that they came to him. But nevertheless, like Isaiah tells us, he was somebody who was living out in place of obscurity in a time and a place in which that part of the world was the most, probably one of the most unimportant places. He was basically a peasant from a carpenter background, a common man. And yet he is, we know, the son of man and the son of God. And I'm going to invite you, if you would like, you don't have to, to turn to Psalm 22 in the Pew Bible, and I'm going to walk us through this, a little bit of what Jesus is thinking, because many of us know that Jesus, when he was hanging on the cross, one of the things he says is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this is the opening line of Psalm 22. And just as I had to say, a penny saved is a penny served, or for God saved or is a penny earned, for God so loved the world, and you were able to complete that. When Jesus gives this first line, I would like to think that what Jesus is thinking in part is what this whole psalm means. Because I think so often we read this line and we say, Jesus is forsaken. 
And no, he's not. He feels forsaken. That is true because he expresses it from the cross. But I want to walk through Psalm 22 because the rest of the psalm, that Jesus as a Hebrew man would have known this psalm by heart, says this. And as we walk through it, I'm just going to take some things out of it. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And again, maybe some of you have felt forsaken. Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. He does not on the cross. But then the psalmist And Jesus has to remember this too, moves to a little bit of hope, a glimmer of hope. Yet, you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. Jesus is remembering at this moment. If he's remembering the whole psalm, he's remembering that God delivered, his father delivered the people of Israel from the bondage of slavery in Egypt. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. Where is Jesus now moving his hope? It is not in his disciples who fled. It's not in the Jewish authorities that condemned him. It's not in the Roman rulers that maybe could have made a difference. He has to put all of his trust in God, the Father. But then back to how he's feeling on the cross. But I am a worm, not a man. This kind of ties in with what Isaiah was read by Pastor Lucio. I am a worm, not a man. I am scorned by everyone, despised. Now think about these next few words of the scene at the cross. I am scorned by everyone, despised by the people, the people standing around the cross, shouting insults at him, going, Aha! You thought you could take the temple down and three, rebuild it in three days. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults. They shake their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Remember those lines where they said, If he is the Son of God, then why doesn't he just come down? Why is he, the, if he's the Messiah, why doesn't he just get off that cross? Let him deliver him since he delights in him. The taunts and the mockery. And then Jesus says this in the words of the psalmist addressing it back to God. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you even at my mother's breast. We know one of the people who did not flee from Jesus was his mother Mary there seeing her son dying in agony. From birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God as Mary and Joseph, as faithful Jewish parents, raised their child, Jesus, in the faith of God. And so he continues to cry out, Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me, roaring lions that tear me to pieces or tear their prey, open their mouths wide against me. All of that, just the idea that everything is against him. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. If we know anything about crucifixion, he, the man is hanging there, the criminal is hanging there, and it is as if they are being pulled apart and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is turned to wax. We know that there's the, 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 uh, well, the things that could start to happen physically to someone inside their internal organs. And it is melted within me. My mouth is dried like a potsherd. And my tongue sticks to my, the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of the death. Think of him saying, I thirst. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. What's interesting about this is that when the psalmist wrote this, there was no crucifixion. In the days of David, or when these psalms were written, this is nothing anyone understood in the kingdom of Israel. Someone back in the days of David, when this was written, would have said, what do you mean by your hands and feet pierced? This is a prophetic line. All my bones are on display. Again, he's being stretched. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them. They cast lots for my garment. The Roman soldiers dividing up or not wanting to divide his robe, and so they cast lots for it. 
but then again the hope. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength, and I can only imagine that Jesus' strength ebbing away is saying, you are my strength, come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lion. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. He's now looking forward, I believe, to that time where he will live beyond the grave. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. In other words, he knows that his father looks at this suffering not as something that's shameful, but something that is salvation for the world. He has not hidden, hidden his face from him, but he has listened to his cry of help, that is the one crying out. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. For those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. That is, the future glory, he will praise God. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. Jesus is even looking now out with this psalm. This psalm is talking about looking out beyond himself. To all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will bow down before him, for dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. In many ways, what Jesus is saying here, or this psalm is saying, whether Jesus is completely thinking this whole psalm, we don't know. But this psalm is saying that God will be praised for the sacrifice of his Messiah. And as we conclude, it says, all the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. All who cannot keep themselves alive. And we think about that juxtaposition of the rich of the earth feasting and worshiping, and yet they too will die. And yet Jesus is talking, I think, or the psalm is talking about some feast that is beyond the grave, that resurrection and the life beyond. And the posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord, and they will proclaim his, proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. And those last lines to me are the call to all of us as the church that we as the posterity living beyond from generation to generation, the future generations will talk about the Lord and declare his righteousness to people yet unborn. God, though, has done this. What has he done? He has saved all of us on the cross of Jesus. And despite the pain and the feelings of despair, Jesus remembers a psalm that ultimately is not about being forsaken. It's about a future hope for all people who come to him. That future hope to be relieved from the burden of the slavery of sin. Let me switch gears again. Today is April 15th. Usually, taxes are due today, right? But we have an extension. And at first, I thought it was because of Good Friday, but then Chris and I were talking about it. We said, no, that can't be the case. Good Friday is a religious holiday, and we avoid those in our country. And so we looked it up. And the reason is, is because in Washington, D.C., this is actually Emancipation Day. It is a day that celebrates the first time that the slaves in the United States, the African-American slaves, were emancipated. This wasn't the big Emancipation Proclamation of a year later, but this was in 1862. And at first, I thought to myself, well, that's just a holiday for people in Washington, D.C. to get votes for the people that live in Washington, D.C. I'm a little bit cynical sometimes. But then I started to think about this day. And what emancipation means to a large segment of our population. Because if we think for a moment about slavery, think about what it really was. People who were taken from their peaceful homes by invaders, some of them of their own skin color, betraying them, 
to others of another skin color, taking them to the coast when maybe these people had never seen an ocean before, put on the ships, crammed into the holds of these ships so that when they would, one person would move, all the people would have to move, that the filth would not be cleaned up from them, that oftentimes one-third of the human cargo would die on the passage from Africa to the Americas. They lost not only their home, they lost their family, they lost their relationship, they lost their identity. They were beaten, they were humiliated, they had no hope, they were forsaken, and to my mind, other than the Holocaust, I cannot think in history of a time in which there has been a greater hell on earth. And yet, isn't this what sin does to all of us? Sin makes us a slave. Sin separates us from our original home with God. We wander. We suffer. Oftentimes we could think of eternity in a manner that we feel forsaken. And we become slaves and are condemned to a hopeless future. And so when we think about emancipation, I think what we want to think about too is the freedom that we have only that comes ultimately through Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. As all of us probably know, one of the great songs, hymns that comes out of the history of the church is what we call the battle hymn of the Republic. And this song gets it written in the height of the Civil War. Here are some lines from it that sometimes we forget. He has sounded forth the trumpet that is Christ, that shall never sound retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before the judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. And then these lines, the last verse, that put it in real context for this idea of being free from something, not just of slavery, but the slavery of sin. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. And as he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free while God is marching on. The, slave, the chains of slavery in this world could only be broken with the sacrifice of human blood. Abraham Lincoln said that. It was a price we had to pay. But likewise, and more importantly for eternity, the eternal chains of sin can only be broken by something far greater than the blood of soldiers on the battlefield. The eternal chains of sin can only be broken by the holy blood of of the Son of God. What was Jesus thinking on the cross? In his pain and in his despair, he was thinking of you. He was thinking of me. He was thinking of every person in this world. Not everyone, unfortunately, will accept this great and tremendous gift to free us from the burden of sin. But we no longer need to forsake. Your chains of sin are broken by Jesus Christ because Jesus sees each one of us and says, you are worth it. While he was on that cross thinking and saying, why have you forsaken me? Nevertheless, nevertheless, he went there for each one of us. So if there's ever a time that you feel forsaken or alone, or discouraged. Remember how much you are valued. Remember that you indeed, because of the chains that were broken on the cross, are free. You are free indeed. Thanks be to God for his great mercy and love towards us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you, John, and thank you, Pastor John, too, you know, for uh, sharing us today about uh, what this day, you know, means for us, and remind us what does, uh, Jesus did on the cross for us in that day. That's the way that we celebrate. Um, we're going to have uh, some after here. I uh, want to just uh, close with prayer, but I want to let you know, of you, that we have some refreshment. Um, well, in that place. <laughs> uh, and um, yeah, to join us, uh, to be with us, uh, to, to meet new people, to be able to communicate each other. So um, you're welcome to come. And uh, I'm going to close you know, with a prayer. Um, Father, uh, thank you so much for uh, being with us today. Uh, bless this time that we will have you know, all together. Bless this time that we could uh, celebrate uh, what you did for us. Lord, bless us and keep us. Lord, make your face shine upon us. God, give us grace, gracious to us. And um, Lord, lift up your face upon us and uh, give us peace. Today and forever. Amen. Thank you, everyone.